Welcome to All Things Green. I'm Shelby, here with my co-host Anton to discuss a variety of topics across the sustainability universe. Anton, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How was your fourth? My fourth was really good. Um, similar to previous times in the summer, I, I spent a lot of time outside, but this time I remembered to wear sunscreen so I didn't burn so badly. Nice, yeah. Do you remember when we talked about sunscreen and sunburns a, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago at this point? Yeah. I have to admit something to you. Uh-oh. I was a victim of greenwashing. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. yeah. You know, that greenwashing gets you. It's not your fault. Yeah. You know, as a, a an advocate for all things green, I, I hope to be a better researcher, but that wasn't really a planned segment. And I, I made mention to reef safe sunscreen. I learned yeah. about it when I was on a trip in Mexico and the wildlife a uh, leader who is sort of leading us through our adventure told us about it. And then I saw it in stores and kind of made an assumption that all that was true. But I just wanted to set the record straight that there are lots of sunscreens that are labeled reef safe, but it's kind of a mixed bag scientifically. So essentially, yes, you can go purchase something that's called reef safe. And all it means is that it doesn't have certain chemicals in it, but some sunscreens may be better than others, but none are known to be truly reef safe because we can't narrow down to which specific chemicals it is. Interesting. Um, reefs are really sensitive. And yeah. so... So you uh, just got to burn when you go see the reefs, basically. Well, there are alternatives. So, <laughs> for example, you could try to stay out of the sun during like peak hours of sunshine, like between 10 and 2. Or you can wear ultraviolet protective factor sunwear, like long t-shirts or pants or hats, other things that can protect your skin from the sun. <laughs> yeah. Those are just options for folks who want a, a green alternative. But yeah, I just yeah, wanted yeah. to put it out there. Well, we really stand by trying to be as accurate as possible. So we'll leave some more links in the okay. show notes today to uh, correct myself. Yeah. Well, when I explore those reefs, I'll go in my denim jeans and my denim jacket so I don't burn. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to be the best possible option. <laughs> I think we have to worry about microplastics. Dang it. Yeah. Nothing's perfect. You know, hot take. If sunscreen's not good for the reefs, is it good for me? Okay, well, <laughs> we'll have a whole different public health conversation. Yes, wear sunscreen. Um, but let's move on to some other life choices. We're talking okay. about all things right. living sustainably today. Yeah. Um, we've talked before about how we live here in Northeast Ohio and it's kind of this climate haven. We've got relatively mild summers, we have access to a lot of fresh water, uh, but not everywhere looks and feels like that, right? Yeah, there's no place like Cleveland. Yeah, um, I was thinking about where I live a lot lately because I just purchased a home. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but it also means I had to purchase home insurance. So home insurance has been on my mind. And so when I saw an article that talked about the way that climate change is affecting insurance companies, I wanted to dive deeper into learning more about living in climate danger zones. So um, it turns out that not only is climate change affecting us and the planet, it's also affecting insurance companies. Ah. Yeah. Subsequently influencing how much you'd pay for insurance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So some insurance companies have stopped selling new home insurance policies in California because of consistent, hmm. terrible wildfires. Um, others have pulled out of Florida because of tropical storms and flooding. And some insurance companies, up to seven in the state of Louisiana, have failed since Hurricane Ida in 2021. So they wow. paid out so much money for homes that were destroyed in natural disasters. So I wanted to ask you, uh, when you bought your house, did you think at all about the environmental risks here in Northeast Ohio? Well, yeah, there's, I did a little bit. There's not, there's not as much as like, you know, there's no hurricanes blowing through here or uh, wildfires really. Mm -hmm. um, I really did think about flooding, like basement flooding. Mm -hmm. I think that might have to do maybe a little bit more with like our ancient infrastructure. But when I bought the house, I just make sure the basement didn't flood. That was, that was really it, to be honest with you. That's basically all I looked for as well. My husband has some childhood trauma from his basement flooding over and over in uh, northwest Pennsylvania, yeah. our, our neighbors. Um, and so we definitely went to houses on rainy days and looked to see if they were flooding. But that's all I really worried about here. Yeah. Um, I wasn't thinking about wildfires or tropical storms or any right, of these like right. major disasters. How much did you know about home insurance before you bought it? Like, would you have thought about like what yeah. you needed? I mean, like, honestly, I, the only thing I really knew about 
like homeowners insurance was like Florida's rates are like kind of crazy because they got hurricanes rolling through. Yeah. And also like, I don't even know. I mean, people must be pretty rich to own like those Marco Island homes, right? If they're like paying out that high insurance rates. <laughs> yeah. So th this is where it gets complicated. Uh, so insurance is a necessary part of owning a home yeah. because you're, you're living there. All of your things are there. Your mm -hmm. important documents are there. It's where you put your head at night. And so when your home is destroyed, yeah. insurance offers some level of protection so that you can reclaim some of the money that you've lost um, and help you replace things like documents. But honestly, looking at my policy, I was just looking at, okay, well, what's like sort of the minimum that I can get for a decent price that my mortgage company will allow? There's not a lot of education about what you should be looking for. And like you said, it can be really expensive in areas that have been deeply impacted by climate change and climate related natural disasters. Mm -hmm. So there are some states, there are 30 now total, I believe, that are participating in what are called FAIR plans, F-A-I-R plans, um, which are considered public insurers of last resort. So those essentially are states, including Ohio, that have said, okay, everyone who sells insurance here is going to come together to offer a certain level of basic home insurance for folks who can't afford it um, or who can't buy it on the market in another way. Ohio, we talked about, doesn't have, or at least in Northeast Ohio, the same level of climate issues as somewhere like a Florida, a California, a Louisiana, some areas of Texas, for example. But there's still some level of protection, but that's also going to get extremely expensive for states. So mm. I wanted to talk a little bit about the policy levers, but also sort of personal choices that we can make. So on a policy level, there are some policies that can support folks. So um, we hope, obviously, that the biggest way we can support folks who live in areas impacted by climate change is through our advocacy yeah. and mitigating the effects of climate disaster. But we're not going to reduce it overnight, and we're seeing things get worse and worse. So there are options, and not all of them are pretty. One is managed retreat, which essentially means that people can participate in voluntary buyouts. Some governments, including some places in the U.S., may try to buy out people who live in areas that are deeply impacted by natural disasters. Um, but that also means a lot of displacement, uh, especially I want to make clear the difference here between folks who have, you know, you started talking about you must be wealthy to live in some of these areas. In some cases, that's true. Uh, so when we think about a lever like that of being bought out of your home, some people are being bought out of vacation homes. <laughs> yeah, it's complex, right? Cuz yeah, like like you were just about to say, like some people are getting bought out of their multi-million dollar vacation home. Other yes. people are maybe living in like not so great conditions and maybe they got like a like a shack that's falling apart or something, yeah. you know. Yeah. Or even if you just have a regular old modest home, but that's just your primary home, that's your primary community. Yeah. Um I was reading about sort of these islands off the coast of Maryland where uh, people are living, but they're almost all vacation homes. But if there are people who just happen to live, for example, when I lived in Texas, I wasn't in Houston. I was in Austin, but Houston had a terrible hurricane when I was living there. And most people who live in Houston are not there because it's their vacation home. Uh, but some of the policies that are there to support people when they've gone through natural disasters benefit the rich more than they do the poor. Yeah. Because what you get in return for your insurance or other emergency management is uh, congruent or based on how much money you already had before. So if you're a wealthy person and you lose your home to flooding, hurricane, whatever, you're gonna get a higher grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency because they'll say, well, your house was worth more, so you should get more money. But you also probably have a more flexible employer if you're higher up in the chain where they might give you more time off to recover. Or uh, in the case of an article I read, someone who worked for Microsoft, they just gave him $10,000 to help him sort of restart his life. You also can get tax returns for having gone through a natural disaster. So if you're a low-income person and you already didn't have that much that you had to pay in taxes, you're not getting the benefit of that emergency support. Yeah. Whereas someone who's wealthier could get a huge portion of their taxes back if they're able to say, my home was destroyed. I understand that there's a difference in the cost of different homes, but ultimately the utility of it is that two people lost their homes and you can't just turn around with a small amount and buy another home. Yeah. 
so I think we're kind of like walking this line between what's a personal choice and what's sort of like a policy issue here. And I think it's kind of both. Um, some people may have the ability to move to places that are uh, less impacted by climate change, but it's probably going to be wealthier people. And then that just leaves neighborhoods that are falling apart. So I don't know what to do about this situation, but I wanted to bring it to light and talk about the fact that climate danger zones are a real thing uh, and it's affecting the way that people are able to find security in their homes. Yeah. I think there has been precedent for like buying out communities, especially when there's like crazy natural disasters or, or sometimes man-made disasters. Like there's talk about like homes being bought out from East Palestine mm -hmm. because of the, the train wreck in Ohio. Yes. So, I mean, there's precedent for it. There's got to be a way forward to, you know, make sure that people who are oppressed or poor can live a, a fine life and not live in a home that got destroyed by a hurricane. Yeah. I, I just have <laughs> such mixed feelings about the idea of buying people out because on the one hand, it's like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be living in areas where you're going to just consistently have your home re-destroyed by hurricanes. And also, like what right do we have to displace communities that have deep roots in areas that probably weren't always like that, but yeah. the climate is changing because of what we are all collectively doing to the planet. So make the oil and gas, the trillion dollar industries <laughs> buy them out. How about that? <laughs> I guess. Don't make the taxpayers do it. Make these companies that have trillions of dollars do it. That's a hot take. Well, yeah. we'll keep exploring some <laughs> options here. Um, really, there's we try to be really solutions oriented here, and I don't know if I have one big solution. I just kind of wanted to talk about yeah. it. And the there's usually not one big solution, right? Well, that's true, but um, that's that's what I've got for you so far on living yeah. in climate danger zones. You want to talk about uh, something a little bit more up? <laughs> yeah, let's talk about something a little bit more up. <laughs> Sounds so, good. So yeah, Shelby, are you, you you just bought a home. Are you a homesteader? Would you consider yourself a homesteader? I don't think so. I don't think yeah. I live enough off my own yeah. talent and skills. Yeah, me neither. But we're going to talk about homesteading in this segment. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, the reason why I want to talk about homesteading, uh, we talked a few weeks back about growing your own food, uh, being sustainable in your own lifestyle, using what you have. And uh, I wanted to bring up an article by, um, not an article, a blog by homesteadingfamily.com. Uh, they talked a little bit about how to practice sustainability in your own life. Mm. And uh, one way to do this is making sure that things don't necessarily have to look or be perfect. They really just have to be functional and serve you. I mean, <sighs> My therapist keeps telling me the same thing, and yet I just keep pushing for perfection. <laughs> Ugh, I'll get there eventually. Yeah. Or not. I mean, so some things, some things in like the homesteading realm, they might say, instead of buying that brand new greenhouse, you know, like maybe reuse something that you have, some like old windows or like old scrap lumber, or if you don't even have like the push to have an entire greenhouse, Maybe you could just make like a little cold frame, you know, like lean a window against like a little like wooden thing to catch some sunlight for your lettuce early in the year. Yeah. So, you know, like fun little fixes like that. Uh, other examples might include like just using things that can act as trellises. You don't have to buy these like brand new lacy metal trellises from Home Depot when you have mm -hmm. stuff that you can reuse in your yard. I mean, is, is this like a theme that you might see or want to practice in your life? Yeah, so I mean, you pointed out the the new house that I'm starting to get to work on, and I feel this push from social media, from oh, going yeah. to my friends' homes, from all sorts of things of like, yes, I'm interested in sustainability, so I want to make sustainable choices, but how do I do that in a way that's like also aesthetically pleasing? And I don't think that what you're trying to say is like, just don't worry about it, like you shouldn't get to have things that are nice, but that to be sustainable, it doesn't have to be in its prettiest form. So uh, this yeah. is like a self call out that I know already <laughs> I was starting to think about like, how do I make my mason jars like look really pretty with all of my like dry goods that I've gotten from yeah. the bulk store. Um, but maybe they don't have to be pretty uh, just to, to function. Well, yeah, I mean, I think like we get such pressure from like social media, you know, you're scrolling on your Instagrams and your TikToks and uh, you're just seeing like these like, beautiful people with beautiful homes doing beautiful things. And you're like, oh man, what am I doing over here? Like, right. I'm just like, I don't know, we're using this plastic potted like seed starter. <laughs> and it's like, you know, but honestly, at the end of the day, like you can maybe rest assured that you're not like destroying the earth or something like that. Yeah. I just <laughs> ran into this 
this week because okay so I was not here for our, our last episode, so I watched you talk to Joe King yeah. about Rust Belt Writers and all sorts of other work, and it reminded me that because I'm moving into a new home, I could sign up for Rust Belt Writers. Yeah. So shout out to the show. It influenced me. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed up for Rust Belt Writers so I can start composting at home because I didn't have access to that where I lived previously. And I started Googling like cute compost bins and immediately my husband was like that's where our food waste goes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be cute um so this is just a good reminder to me that like um as much as we deserve to live in spaces that feel nice to us i can make it nice without everything like being optimized maybe yeah 100 percent. that's actually really funny that you brought up the composter i actually had like a very similar experience so like i had a composter but i was looking for like kind of like a like a bucket of some sorts mm-hmm. to like put on my kitchen counter where the food scraps would go in until mm-hmm. it's full enough to go into the composter, right? So I was like researching, looking at different things. And then like, it was kind of like early on in the show. Like I think the show is honestly kind of changed the way I think about like overbuying, mm-hmm. you know, just using what you have. I was biking around Kelly's Island actually mm-hmm. months ago. And I actually saw like this like gallon sized ice cream tub just on the side of the road. And I'm like, oh, that's my compost bucket. So nice. I just picked it up and I'm like, boom, you got a compost bucket. Because like sometimes the, the more sustainable option, it's also the cheaper option. That's true. Like we don't have to just consume and, and buy everything. Um, one of my guilty pleasures is like uh, going to Aldi. Mm-hmm. When And Aldi's has like the best stuff. Like it's got cool stuff. But like just that temptation to like buy stuff because it's cheap. It's, yes. it's not always the most sustainable option, you know. When I, when I try and go to the grocery store or uh, when I need to buy something, anything, or even if it's just like a new obsession, mm-hmm. like, oh, I need a dehydrator. Like, yeah. I always want to, I always want to like check Facebook Marketplace or the thrift first because like, just like kind of buying into that consumer mentality, I think is, I don't know, it's kind of a rat race in, yeah. some, in some sorts, you know? Yeah. And I think you, you talked earlier about Instagram. We end up seeing like a corner of someone's home that they've perfectly curated. And so you start thinking your whole home should be yeah. able to look like that. Or at least that's the feeling I get inside is, okay, well, yeah. but where do they put their cooking oil? Because yeah. like that doesn't look cute with its wrapper. Do I need to buy something separate that then I pour my cooking oil into? And if you want to do that, that's your jam. Go for it. There are sustainable ways to do yeah. that. But sometimes the most sustainable thing is just to work with what you already have. Um, Or like, why would I get another thing with right now the most accessible cooking oil comes in plastic? Like, why am I going to pour that from that plastic into glass so it looks like I'm being sustainable? Just like admit to the world that I'm using cooking oil that comes in a plastic jug and like, just let that be. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good reminder for me as I'm moving in and thinking about, oh my gosh, you know what would look cute here is this thing when maybe I could repurpose something I have. I'm not saying never buy something new. Um, I am. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But the idea that maybe sometimes we can make a better choice, thrift it, use something you already have, not worry so much about whether it's perfect. Yeah. I feel like um, as Americans, we're like really good at consuming. I have relatives over in Croatia and they do like an awesome job of just like using what they have. Of course, they, they don't have as much money, so maybe it's almost because of happenstance. But like, they are really good at just like a minimalistic lifestyle. Like, mm-hmm. they have these full like two story homes still, but like they just seem to buy less. They seem to use more of what they have. And like, I don't know. I kind of want to strive to have that more simplistic, minimalistic lifestyle. Like, just less headaches, honestly. You know. Yeah. Like, as I'm moving my books, I'm feeling that way right yeah. now. Yeah. About 20 boxes of books so far. Listen, we all have our faults. And yeah. Mine's, you know, mine's going to be books. <laughs> we're all working on it. So, yeah, I guess the moral of the story is like, you know, use what you got. It doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to look Instagram worthy to, to serve you, you know. Keep reminding me of that when I yeah. come in and ask you, hey, do you like this or that or this or that? And you just go, <laughs> what do you already have, Shelby? <laughs> Let me find you that on Marketplace. Well, anyways, Shelby, take us away into our last segment. Yeah, well, speaking of things we already have, um, I want to talk a little bit about ocean waste, which is something we have in spades. Mm. So I was lucky enough to go on vacation this past week to Chautauqua, New York, which is a wonderful little community in western New York. Uh, And I'm at this institute on this beautiful pedestrian grounds, and everywhere I walk, there's these huge art pieces. And as you get closer, you realize that 
Well, they're all sea creatures, first of all. They're big, huge sculptures, like bigger than you that and me. That looks kind of cool. And they're also made out of all sorts of little pieces of plastic and uh. other seemingly trash. So like an example it was there was this big fish sitting close to the water. You know, I couldn't even wrap my arms around it. It was so big. Mm. And then it has this little signage around it that talks about what it is and then what it's made out of. So this is made out of 40 plastic bottles and 20 bottle caps and one magic school bus replica. I mean, just like all sorts <laughs> of stuff. And then it tells you that all of it was found uh, in the ocean or as like waste on the beach that's washed ashore. And so actually it turns out that it's from this organization called Washed Ashore. Their mission is to build and exhibit aesthetically powerful art to educate a global audience about plastic pollution in the ocean and waterways to spark positive changes mm. in consumer habit. Uh, so I thought that was an amazing mission. Uh, very similar to what we're doing it, as far as the goal of bringing awareness. Yeah. yeah, you won't see me building any sculptures. Well, maybe not yet. I could <laughs> I could see you really getting into some some edible cabbage sculptures. Oh yeah, I mean I could I could maybe do that, or maybe like if we're doing like little like Star, like Star Wars Legos or something like that. Like, totally, totally. Yeah. Use what you have. Yeah. Even Star Wars Legos. <laughs> but anyway, still they're trying to do something that is positive, that's beautiful. Um, and solutions-based, but also talking about issues, showing people who may not think about it all the time that this is what's in our waterways. Like I had a statue in front of me that, I, as I said, I, I couldn't wrap my arms around, and it was one of maybe 10 or 12 that were on loan to the institution, and that all came out of the ocean. Mm. Um, the structures that hold it up, the formation of it, it's, it's all waste. Uh, so it made me want to dive a little bit deeper into the Wash to Shore project. And I found that they actually have a curriculum for educators, anyone who's working with children specifically, That's cool. um, think more like 10 and under and not like 16 year olds. And they go through sort of a five step curriculum to help educate uh, young people about pollution. So I wanted to talk to you about it and then get your impression yeah. of, of this curriculum. So first they teach young people to love the ocean. So get to know its creatures, its shores, and its impact on all of our lives. Where do we get our water? How does the water affect us? How cute are sea turtles? That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> then they talk about plastic pollution. So now that you love of the ocean, you also uh, learn that plastic pollution is kind of ruining it. Then they learn about how arts enliven us, understand the power of visual art, performance yeah. art, etc. And it's, it's power to sort of help us talk about ideas. Then talk about the R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And they add in refuse. I don't think they invented that, but I thought it was interesting they included it. Wait, what is refuse? Essentially like refusing to take on new things. Uh, uh, refusing to participate in things that are going to produce more you know that's kind of cool kind of like you just talked about refusing yeah. the trellis that you don't really need yeah <laughs> um and they also talk about the realities of recycling and that some of the plastic pollution that we talked about in the second lesson comes from what we think is being recycled and finally eco shift is what they call that last step actually talking about changing individual habits so what do you think about that curriculum and how we teach kids about uh, ocean waste yeah i think that's awesome like being able to like learn to love Earth's creatures. Mm -hmm. I wish there was like curriculum for that when I was younger. Like I feel like I would have actually like maybe resonated with that more, you know? Like I was such an animal lover as a kid. Yes. Uh, still kind of am. But like, yeah, that's way cooler than just learning about like Earth science and like in a, in a I don't know, maybe, what's the word I'm looking for? Impersonal kind of way. Yes, I think so too. I like that we start with building appreciation for Earth before we move into like the Earth is being destroyed because it's so easy to become a nihilist about this uh, yeah. uh, when you think like, well, the Earth is already ruined. But if you start by saying like, look at manatees, then maybe it's easier to say we have to protect them. Yeah. This is what we're fighting for. Um, I also wanted to ask your opinion on or experience maybe in how you reduce plastic in your life if that's an effort you're making yeah um i guess we talked maybe a little bit about this but like going to the grocery store um that's that's the biggest place where i would probably be 
purchasing like single use plastics, right? Mm -hmm. Like the plastics that I'm going to buy once, they're going to end up in the, the trash can or the recycle bin, which usually ends up in the landfill or getting yeah. burned in low income communities anyways. Um, I try and buy foods or go to food stores that you can just bring your own container or like um, have a reusable bag where you can just put produce in it and there's no like plastic wrappings on the cucumbers or like just unnecessary packaging. That, that all just comes off right when I get home and put it in the fridge anyways, you know? Yeah, totally. So, yeah. I, I use, like, um, reusable bags when I go yeah. collect my produce at the store. Um, and those don't have to be expensive. You can go to the thrift store and find all sorts of little bags or reuse any, any fabric that you have at home to turn it into bags. Yeah. That way you don't have to take those plastic bags to just put your apples in. Um, and like you said, in your segment, they don't have to be cute. You don't have to do the Instagram worthy little mesh knit ones. If you have them, great. I don't. Mine were very cheap. They were gifted to me by a friend who wasn't using them. And they're like all stained from all the fruits and vegetables I've put in them over the years. But I've probably reduced a thousand tiny plastic yeah. bags by reusing the 10 little cotton ones that I have for yeah. the last, I don't know, five or six years. You know, I... I wish there were more grocery stores because I feel like the, the grocery stores that like have uh, where you just kind of have to pull up with your own containers, sometimes mm -hmm. they're like the more boutique-y, more expensive grocery yeah. stores. I wish that was kind of like a more normal thing totally. or like even just more accessibility to like farmer's markets, like that fresh food that you can just roll up with your car and or your bike and put it in your satchel or trunk and <laughs> yeah, totally. ride off. Um, you know, another thing I would like to call for on the show is like, uh, how cool would it be if, like, uh, you could just bring your own containers to, like, restaurants and stuff? Like, that's something that really, like, pisses me off because I'm, like, trying to, like, just get, like, I don't know, a good curry or something. And it ends up in, like, this plastic, like, like Tupperware that, like, is probably going to get used a few times, but it's, like, going to get destroyed in the microwave or something. Or, like, styrofoam, which is the worst. Yeah. Like, styrofoam, like, I feel like it's just poisoning me in real time. I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, horrible. But, yeah, like... Yeah, I've seen places that allow you to take it for like your leftovers if you dined in, but if you're just getting something to go, yeah, yeah. most places give it to you in plastic. So yeah. I just, I wanted to talk about Wash Ashore because we've just discussed all sorts of different ways that plastic comes into our lives, even when we're trying to be cognizant of it. And it's yeah. going to keep happening unless yeah. we take more of a stand. So I'm so glad that there are organizations like Wash Ashore that are out there doing education for young people and then also doing education on this grander scale with these art pieces that help us stop, talk about it, think about it, so that we can all go to step five of their curriculum, eco shift, and try to change some of our own individual habits. Yeah. Um, caveat that we always do, which is that we want to change individual habits as much as we can, and also that's not going to solve the climate crisis on its own. So yeah. we will continue to talk about larger scale policy things that we can do, um, but every little bit helps. So yeah. go visit Wash to Shore's website if you want to learn more. And like every time, links will be in the show notes yeah. for everything we talked about today. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking all things green with me today, Anton. No, Shelby, thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. How about you let the uh, listeners and viewers know how they can keep up to date with us? Oh, Keely do Keely. If you'd like to stay connected to us, be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at One Planet Media. That's O N E 1. And if you'd like to rewatch full episodes, check out our YouTube channel, All Things Green Show. You can find all of our sources in today's episode in our show notes. We'll be back at the same time next week to bring you more news. Thank you for being a part of the global sustainability movement. <laughs>